。瓷器是历史的见证，是最日常的器物。Hello and welcome to episode six of this series of podcasts, My Stories of Chinese Porcelain. I hope you're enjoying hearing these podcasts about porcelain. This time, I want to talk about the British porcelain brand Wedgwood and how it was born from the collision between the West and the East. I am Turing May, a craftsman and writer on Chinese porcelain based in Qingduoshan, China, known as the porcelain capital. Before I tried to make porcelain by myself, I studied porcelain history and technique. A friend of mine knew what I was doing and asked for my opinion about the selection of some porcelain as a gift for a VIP customer of his. That customer was Chinese and also a fan of porcelain. My friend mentioned that even though that person may not have an in-depth knowledge about porcelain, working for a multinational company meant he travelled a lot around the world and saw plenty of it. My friend really wanted to impress him with something meaningful, precious, and in good taste. I told him that he could choose some post 1753 products from the British porcelain brand Wedgwood, or from the German brand Meissen after 1710. My friend was surprised by my words and asked, "Why not any porcelain made in China? Is that because there are no high-quality porcelain products from China?" Of course, there are plenty of good quality porcelain products from China, but when you talk about the porcelain brands from hundreds of years ago, well, there are none of them in China. Unfortunately, although Qingduoshan is the porcelain capital of the world and is filled with so many historical workshops, there were no commercial brands created from there. In my friend's situation, he would be far better off buying an expensive gift as a status symbol from one of the world-famous porcelain brands, rather than to source a rare piece from an anonymous workshop. That may save both his face and his time explaining the value and source of the piece to a doubtful mind. The anonymous workshop may have produced a handmade masterpiece through a complicated process. But the face value attached to the big brands is higher, and so easier to appreciate. Yes, it is an awkward situation because China invented porcelain around 2,000 years ago, and the European porcelain industry was almost a thousand years younger than its Chinese counterpart. Historically, the Chinese porcelain industry dominated. Topping world production and worldwide trade for hundreds of years in terms of volume, sales, and quality. In the past, it was a case of no contest for competing neighboring countries like Korea, Vietnam, and Japan. But how did Chinese porcelain decline, and when did it happen? I'm going to talk about that over the next episodes. In 1793, a very significant event happened between the West and China. In that year, the British king George III's first envoy to China, Ambassador Macartney, arrived in China. Officially, his mission was to celebrate the Chinese Emperor Qianlong's birthday, but its real purpose was to negotiate for a direct and official connection with the Chinese government and to open more trading ports in China. The British were hoping to change the trade imbalance driven by Great Britain's demand for Chinese tea. Porcelain and silk. While at that time China needed almost nothing from Great Britain other than the opium pushed by the British East India Company, the British mission had over 700 members, and they brought lots of presents with them, hoping to get Chinese Emperor Qianlong's interest and attention. There were lots of manufactured goods representing the industrialization happening in Europe. The gifts ranged from scientific instruments, household products. Industrial tools to guns and model warships, Wedgwood jasperware, including the Wedgwood catalogue with a description of the Portland vase, were also among the gifts. Emperor Qianlong was so arrogant and ignorant; he refused the idea of purchasing any products from Great Britain, and thought China, as the Middle Kingdom, had everything it needed for its people. He could never have imagined that in the 21st century. Every Chinese today would be using a mobile phone, not only for phone calls but also for daily payments. That mission in 1793 was a failure for the British, 
and that may have laid the seeds for the later Opium War. To the modern Chinese view, Qianlong's attitude was out of touch and ridiculous, which was exactly how the British felt at the time. But the Wedgwood Company then made their own efforts to break into the Chinese market. Founded in May 1759 by the English potter Josiah Wedgwood in Stoke-on-Trent, England, Wedgwood soon became successful at producing fine earthenware and stoneware that was accepted as equivalent in quality to porcelain, but much cheaper. Please note, Wedgwood started with stoneware products first and only produced true porcelain at a later stage. Wedgwood's most famous jasper ware is called Wedgwood Blue. It looks like the ancient Roman cameo glass. Wedgwood Blue is the most popular colour and the darker shade is sometimes called Portland Blue. In the late 19th century, Wedgwood became a leader in design and technical innovation. The business has flourished for more than 200 years through two world wars and many generations. The Emperor Qianlong reigned in China from 1735 to 1796. At that time, the Chinese handmade porcelain industry was at its peak, while the West was at the beginning of industrialization. At that stage, the advantages of industrialization were not obvious, and in many aspects, the products of the traditional handmade process were far better than the industrialized ones. For example, during the Qianlong era, the porcelain craftsmen in Qinghuashen created the so-called revolving and reticulated double vase, just for the royal family. It was so beautiful, sophisticated and delicate, really more than words can say. Not only did every detail of the vase showcase the highest standards in fine art and luxury features, but when the vase was turned, you could also see the changing pictures that were painted on the inner surface through the gaps on the outer layer. It was truly unbelievable. In November 2010, the British Bainbridge Auction House in Ricelip, Middlesex sold such a Chenlong-era royal family vase for an unexpected £53 million, making it the most expensive porcelain item ever. Such a sophisticated product was impossible to make by machine in the early age of industrialization. But comparing the Chinese handmade porcelain industry with the West's modern industrialization is like watching a race between a horse and a racing car. The horse may be quicker at the beginning on the bumpy, unsealed and dusty road, but once they reach the highway, the horse has no chance of winning. Another major difference is the motivation and drivers behind the two types of industry operations. Chinese porcelain was passively spread across the world, not by its own marketing efforts, but by the strong demands of profit-driven Europeans. Wedgwood, on the other hand, was actively seeking to expand its market, and the first British envoy to China presented its products to the Emperor Qianlong. Those differences made the ending a foregone conclusion. Industrialization will win in the mass market and ultimately prevail. Writing about McCartney's 1793 visit to China, the French writer Alain Perfit describes it as the collision of two civilizations and in his book, The Immobile Empire, summarized it perfectly thus. The Chinese empire was immobile because these attitudes stifled China's natural creativity and kept it bureaucratic, static and feeble over the following century and a half. The Chinese porcelain industry's ups and downs are maybe a good example of that collision. The country China, with a capital C, was possibly named by the West after a household item, China with a small c. By the way, when King George III received porcelain gifts from the Chinese emperor, I guess he would not have been as excited as his ancestor had been. Thanks for listening to this episode. In the last two episodes, I will talk more about the actual porcelain-making process and the final straw that destroyed the old Chinese porcelain industry. I hope you will join me again. This has been a China Plus podcast. Original Chinese reading was by Sanlian Chongdu, with English translation by Graham Stevens. 
If you like the show, please give us a rating and subscribe to us wherever you listen. If you've got any questions or feedback, please feel free to contact us via email at podcast at cri.com.cn or on Twitter at hashtag China Plus Pods.